Thank you, Anna, and welcome, everyone. So my first talk in over two years is kind of interesting seeing real people. I've done a few talks, but it's been to the wall, and that's very weird. So it's kind of nice to see some faces for a change. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, releasing software. Who would like to release software more often? <laughs> few people, I see a lot of people don't really want to. Is, <laughs> is that because you're scared of doing it? Terrified? <laughs> yeah, like, I've been through the world where I've been terrified of releasing the software. Like, is anybody not terrified of releasing software? Okay, you don't know enough. <laughs> if you're not even just a little bit scared, you probably haven't done it enough. So even if you do it really often, it still is a little bit queasy to do that. So it's a kind of interesting world. So I want to talk about how do we release software more often, doing it hot deployed to systems, and what kind of matters about this. So kind of interestingly, of the people who do release software fairly often, do you need to schedule downtime? Nope. So you can do hot upgrades already. So it's, I'm going to leave now. Everybody knows what they're doing here. This is absolutely fine. So most people need to schedule downtime for uh, releasing the software because it's kind of interesting. For the ones who are saying they don't need to schedule downtime, how do you patch your operating system? Like, does your users notice whenever you reboot the system? Usually they would. Or maybe your system is so slow at responding. Like, let's face it, many web pages are. You don't notice the fact that you've rebooted the operating system. Some of the systems I work on are a bit different. But it's kind of interesting when you look at, well, what's the cost of the downtime of any given system? I've been looking around and trying to find some decent studies on this. And a lot of people refer to this one. It's a fairly old study from Gartner. And they were looking at it being typically around about $5,600 per minute it costs a business for downtime. And there's quite a range on that. And also the different disciplines depend on what, what uh, background you're in. Like a slightly more updated version of this. And it seems to be trending over time that the cost of downtime is getting to be even more significant that's out there. So quick pop quiz, what is the most common cause of downtime in systems that's unplanned? Deployments. Deployments? Kind of close. It's usually operator error or misconfiguration. That's the most common case. Second most common case, so said around 2016, what was the second most common case? Anyone guess? Hacking, really close, but not quite. It's typically failure of your underlying platform, be it your UPS, your hardware, the software, or something that you're running on. So I'm just categorizing it. And third is actually cyber attacks. And between about 2006 and 2016, cyber attacks went from being almost insignificant to being, towards the end of 2016, the second most common case of why people had downtime when they're out there. So this is kind of interesting. And that trend is a very steep lineup. I'm trying to find some recent studies, but it's, it's probably by far the most common case now of downtime. And often people don't even know it's happened until it's too late. So kind of interesting questions like, how often do you security patch your systems? Many people don't do it that often. I'm, I'm often called in to help people make their systems faster, more responsive, sort of lower latency and that sort of side. One of the things I often do, just as soon as I see a new system, is I type up time, see how long the system's been up. I often see uptime in months or even over a year on a primary server in production. That usually tells me that they haven't upgraded the system, hasn't rebooted. They probably haven't deployed much software in that time is usually what's going on. And really interestingly, they probably haven't security patched their system. And often these are financial services systems as well, which is kind of terrifying that's out there. Why can this be kind of interesting as well? Like, I don't like to talk about cloud computing. Anybody who knows me, I, I really get annoyed at the names we give stuff. Like, what does cloud actually mean? It means you're renting servers off someone, basically. So when we're renting servers off someone else, do you think they get patched? Do you think updates get applied to them? Yes, they absolutely do. 
I know most of the cloud providers have regular patch cycles and they have SLS on how long it'll be before a security vulnerability is fixed and it's nice and tight. What this means is your servers just go poof and they're gone in production quite regularly when you're renting the servers of someone else. That means downtime unless you can deal with it and you know what you're dealing with that's out there. Ask your provider what is their regular patch cycle and that could maybe explain why you just lose machines in production quite often. And go to check some of this out. So I think fundamentally quality matters in what we do. So I'm not going to talk about how we build systems from a functional perspective that most people talk about. I'm not talking about how you do a feature for payments or for transacting on something. I kind of leave that for other talks. I want to talk about the qualities of our underlying systems and how we put them together. And you'll hear terms like NFRs. I detest this term. What do you mean? It's non-functional? So like, the system isn't secure. Is that functional or not? I damn well want it to be secure, and that's a bit of function I want. If it's going to be high throughput, yes, that's a function of the system I want. Well, how's that a non-function? It's just kind of bizarre. I, I just generally hate this term, <laughs> non-functional requirements. And don't get me started on many of the other things. Anybody else who knows me, sort of things like random access in memory, pick up a dictionary and find out what random actually means. Would you really want that way to access your memory in your system? I don't think so. So, Taking it back on top of the qualities of a system, in fact, in architecture design these days, we talk about the quality attributes of a system, not the non-functional requirements. So one of my little call-outs, please start changing how we talk about things in this industry. And I want to talk about 24-7 particularly. So if we're going to run 24-7, like why are we doing this and what we can do that's out there? See, even this bothers me. 24 divided by 7? Does anybody else just seem to look at what we do as an industry and think, like, are we basket cases? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I've reached the point. I got all my COVID vaccines. It was fine. I'm old enough to get it nice and early. <laughs> I'm sure you're there too, Dave. But why are we doing 24-7? And what are the main reasons for it? You'll see out there. We're running in a world of pervasive devices. We don't use our computers just at work. Virtually everybody in this room, I'm sure, has got a very powerful computer in their pocket, their phone. We use these all the time. So people want a service to be always on because we will use them at any given time of the day. And that's a kind of normal thing now. We also are totally global as a world now. People are using our services from all corners of the planet. That means it's 24-7. Like, I work in a team developing software, and the four key developers, there's me in England, one of the guys is in Switzerland, one guy in New Zealand, and the other one's on the west coast of America. We just got to get used to the fact that we're in a world where the time zones are very just spread out, and so we're used to being always on. So finding the quiet time in the day whenever you can do an upgrade, it's often not that easy. And also, fundamentally, we're in a very competitive world. If you have a system that's not always on and your competitors do, people are going to start to prefer their system because they can get to it any time. I, I get really annoyed whenever my bank decides to just shut itself down for a few hours to do an upgrade. Why? It shouldn't need to. I know why they do need to because I was involved in some of those systems in the 90s, so I'm partly to blame for it. <laughs> and there's reasons why we want to get better. So to do this 24-7 always on, it very much overlaps with high availability because a lot of what we do to make a system highly available enables us to make things run 24-7 and be able to do hot deployments and all that sort of good thing. So the uptime is when we talk about dealing with being 24-7. We've got to look at that, but looking at do we include scheduled maintenance or not? I live in a world where the scheduled maintenance is not allowed. If you're running stuff that people can access at any time, we want that to be not something that we lose out on. And we're still seeing it happen a bit in our industries. And sometimes we're forced into where we make mistakes, where we have to do a hot upgrade or a, 
sort of forklift shift of something, but we're trying not to do that as much as we can. So let's go through a little bit of an alphabet soup of high availability. So you've heard of mean time between failure. So we're looking at our given up time is how often are our systems failing? So when they do fail, whenever that happens, what's the mean time to recovery? That starts to matter. And this is where we can work out what our availability is. Because if you're feeling often and it takes a long time to recover, you're going to be down a lot of the time. So we want to look at improving those two type of metrics. Other metrics you'll hear in this same space is RTO, which is the recovery time objective. So if something goes wrong, how long does it take you to recover to get back up again and be there? And that starts to particularly apply whenever we're doing hot upgrades because as I'll get into a little bit of the detail, there will always be bits of a system's down, but how do you get the rest of the system up again and going? It's very uh, similar is to mean time to recovery in a way of looking at it. And recovery point objective is another way of looking at these systems. So whenever something goes disastrously wrong, fundamentally how much data you're gonna lose and uh, trying to keep that window as small as possible. In fact, actually in many, critical systems, we don't want any data to ever be lost. So two of my clients that I work on are two of the world's largest reserve national banks. They don't want to lose a pension fund being moved between two major banks, things like that. There, there isn't acceptable data loss. There would be riots in the streets if some of that stuff went missing at that sort of scale. So we need to be sure that we can have these systems always on, but they never lose any data. Why can we not have these nice things? What's always the problem? Like, we want to have the nice things. Why can we not have the nice things? Well, it's always the state. State is always the case. Like, I hear many people saying, yeah, we can do hot upgrades. It's all great. And you look at their system, and what they're talking about is a stateless service. Sorry, that's easy. <laughs> it doesn't remember anything. It's like a goldfish as a service. Like, every six seconds later, it's gone. <laughs> the tough, tough stuff is the state. Now, some people will just kick the can down the road and shove that state in a database. So, yep, you can hot upgrade your system. How do you hot upgrade your database? That's when it starts to get trickier at that stage. Now, some of our more expensive databases that are out there have some hot upgrade features now, but it's usually at the more expensive end. Although we're seeing a, a migration for many people to open source and quite cheap databases, they don't have a lot of those cool hot upgrade features. So you have to work out how to deal with that. So that means scheduled downtime and maintenance. You can't be doing the 24 seven. The other way you can look at that is, well, how about if I break it up into such small chunks that bits of the system not being available at a given time means that users don't really notice. And that's what many are trying to do. So that's what they're like, if your Amazons and your Ebays and all are doing, is they're breaking their system up into so many little microservices that they're hiding the fact that a bit of it's down at any given point in time. Now, if you're going to do your funds transfer on your bank account, you can't hide that. You can't tuck that away somewhere and wait till later. And like any sort of trading systems, we see these sorts of things, so it becomes important. So how do we manage this state? That's the really interesting problem and deal with it. Well, we've had a technique that's been around a long time. So even people like Dave and I who've been around this industry a long time, pre-exists us. So things like replicated state machines, some really old, but very cool technology that works really nicely. This is one way we can address this. I've just also noticed Robert in the corner who's nodding along. So it's gonna be a, a gathering of the oldies who've been through a lot of this stuff before. So maybe I'm gonna teach some of the young people that we actually had a history in our industry that's been forgotten. <laughs> is that the state problem? We just forgot it again? Did you put it in the database and you didn't update it again? <laughs> maybe this is what's going on. Well, how do these replicated state machines work? Well, we've got a set of events or inputs to our state machine. If we apply them in order and the state machine is deterministic, we arrive at a given state. So the state accumulates over time. So it's see the idea of our state accumulating. Now, if I want to like, restart this system and bring it back to the same point, it's going to get linearly longer in time to do that as I build up states. So that doesn't become a very useful thing. We need to be able to restart this system at some given stage. And you'll see even in always on systems, you still have to go through some of this process. So 
what you do is you can take a snapshot of your state or a checkpoint, some people use as a terminology for it. We capture that state and then we can load that state later in the snapshot and replay the log from that point forward. We can choose how often we take our snapshots or checkpoints and that will make our recovery time faster as long as we can take the snapshots in a reasonably efficient way. Now, often the recovery time is dominated by the replay of the log. You're loading the snapshot can be made relatively efficient and works fairly well. It's usually the replay in the log. And particularly if you're replaying a log in a very high throughput system. If you've got a system that's running in hundreds of thousands of events per second and your snapshot is a day old, that's a lot of data to go through to replay to catch up again. So especially if your system is running at close to full capacity, just in normal operations, when it goes to recover, that's not a good place to be. This is why you want lots of headroom in the performance of your system to be able to recover quite well. So. What about that replicated bit? Well, how do we have these state machines replicated and make them fault tolerant? Well, we need to get that log of inputs replicated to multiple destinations. And if that log of input is in multiple destinations, you'll have termed right ahead log, command log, various different things. But that log of events that's going to go into your state machines, move that to many different destinations, we now have the ability to recover the same state in all of these different destinations. That's a nice place to be. But if we do that, how do we do it and we do it well? Well, the state of the order on that is consensus-based algorithms. I've lived in a world where many people have primary, secondary systems, where one system is your primary, it's recording its events, it's shipping it to a secondary. In the case of failure, we can bring up the secondary. We're much better off having multiple copies of this, more than two, and achieving consensus, and only processing events when consensus is reached. Typically, when you've passed a quorum of members, have reached that point, and then you process events, you know that in the case of any failure of a minority of the members in your system, you will not have data loss and you can keep going and recover from that given point. Now, that's kind of well tried and tested. There's all of the great work by the likes of Ken Berman, Leslie Lamport, Barbara Liskoff. They all did the groundbreaking work in this area and it's gone forward. And so sort of these days, Raft is kind of the de facto way of people approaching this. And there's loads of great analysis. Like, so it's a great area. I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but some of what we're doing is based fundamentally on this. If you want to understand really what the landscape is here, Hattie Howard's work from Cambridge is just superb, which he's reviewed all of the different algorithms in this space. So build on the shoulders of giants and use this stuff. But if you've used this stuff, we can now have our fault tolerance systems that can deal with failure. Now, the failures, so what's the difference really between a failure of a node and a node being taken out to be an upgraded? Start to see the nice link, what's good that's going on here, because if any given node can fail and you can recover from it, you can also take a node out of any given system that's using consensus on it and upgrade it and get it to rejoin again, as long as you're never having more than a minority of the members out at any given time. But there's some interesting bits to this. How do you have low latency fault tolerance in a low latency system? This is where it starts to get quite interesting. And just for reference, what I mean by low latency, some of the systems I work on were the response time from a message coming into a system, reaching consensus, getting things durably on disk across multiple members of a system, processing the event and responding back to a gateway that's come in. So it may not be an end user because you don't know what networks it is from the gateways to your system to those, but from gateway to gateway, we work on systems that are in the order of over a million events per second with sub 20 microseconds latency. So that's what I mean when I say low latency. Often people say low latency it actually means seconds, but everybody's got a context that matters. So how do you deal with failures or not? Well, failures are typically done with timeouts. 
And the timeouts need to be of a sufficient duration so that you're not constantly causing issues because of latency pauses and jitter in your system. So you need to have a really tightly defined system and that's where you can achieve amazing low latency. So if you have a system with a very tightly defined and well-bound latency, you can also have a very tightly defined and well-bound fault tolerance latency as well, but kind of separate and bigger subject. So we get to that. Now we've, we've got all this nice infrastructure in place and you've read all the great work of the history of this and built on these systems. How do we do our rolling upgrades? So we have our fault tolerance systems. We can have it continue as long as the majority of members in any given cluster are still around. We can go forward and progress. Well, the first bit is the easy bit, is upgrading and patching the system. You've got to apply the security patches. You've got to update the system you're running on, maybe JVM, maybe a compiler, maybe a tool chain, maybe an OS, whatever it is. So the code that you depend on that's not your own code kind of at this stage. So you know that if you're rolling out on these sort of changes, you're not having to have different versions of your system running on top of this. So that underlying platform can be done well. So this is the relatively easy bit. So what I can do is I can take any one of the nodes in my cluster, I can disconnect it from the cluster at that point, I can apply the OS patches to it, I can restart it, and I can join the cluster and continue forward again. So rolling upgrade, by doing that, if I do, say I've got a three node cluster, I can do one node at a time, and by the time I've done all three, I've now upgraded and patched my system. And if you're doing it one node at a time rolling, you don't interrupt the, the user service. So we've got a system that's always on by doing that and it tends to work quite nicely. Now there is some subtleties around which nodes ha happen at which time, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but generally that's the idea. So whenever you bring the node up after it's been upgraded, what you've got to do is you've got to load the snapshot that it has for your existing state, and you replay the log of events since the last snapshot you've got. Now the node's back to the same state as any other node in the cluster, and it's moving forward at that point. But now, to look at the issues of really low latency and what matters, so let's say I take a follower, so that's a raft-based system, I've got a leader and two followers, simplest kind of case. If I take a follower out of the system and I go to upgrade it, if I follow the standard raft sort of protocol that's described, the RPCs in it are synchronous. You make a call with an RPC and you get a response. So the vision is you're replicating data from one node to another. You get a response back saying it's got the data and it's previously stored certain data to a given point, knowing that you can progress. If that node's not around, what do you think happens? Synchronous calls, RPCs, are defined by timeouts. They're bounded by the timeout. So you're blocked waiting for the timeout. And typically that may even be tens of seconds. That means you can't be low latency, you can't have high throughput. So you need to have a different means of dealing with those other nodes. And fundamentally what you do is you do this asynchronously. So you're broadcasting the data out to all of the other nodes and then they're sending back data asynchronously saying what they've got safely. And from there, you're deciding what quorum and consensus is within the cluster This is done on the leader and allowing to progress. But this has to fundamentally be asynchronous. So if you try to take a synchronous approach, you get in trouble. Now, but even with asynchronous, there's some subtleties. There's flow control issues, so you need to be able to discover something's left flow control cleanly without waiting for timeouts and progressing. And the trickiest bit is actually when you go to update the leader at any given point. And to do that, the leader has to step down gracefully rather than wait for timeout, because again, you'll have an issue otherwise. So what'll happen is whenever the leader is gonna be upgraded, it needs to tell the other members, I'm stepping down, one of you need to take over, so it catches the ball and continues on without interrupting service. And so you need those protocols for it to work, and that can happen. But are three nodes enough? That's kind of an interesting question. So the way most consensus-based systems work is you need an odd number because you need to have tiebreakers at times. So for example, if you get a split brain in your network, you don't want to form a cluster and continue on if you've got two nodes because they could both be continuing on thinking they're in charge of the system and running it. 
your state will diverge and you've got a problem. If you have three nodes, what can happen is if one of them gets cut off, the other two can form a stable cluster among them and continue on from that point. So you can continue along as long as the majority of members can still communicate to each other. But if you start doing hot upgrades, you're in an interesting world by you have no spur. So once a node's out being a spur, if you get a failure at that point, your system stops. And so at that point, you're typically looking at five node clusters to be reliable going forward, because this way you can have one node come out, uh, it can be being upgraded, whilst another one could have a failure in the meantime whilst the upgrade's happening, otherwise you get uh, a, a problem with that. So kind of fundamentally, you gotta think about what support does the platform that you're running on have to do a lot of these sorts of things and be able to do it well. In fact, most people are kind of blissfully unaware of a lot of this. And, and so whether you can work on systems, like I, I can kind of plug a system error on that I work on that does a lot of this. There are other systems out there that can do a lot of these sorts of things too, but they're not common. And you, you need to sort of understand, well, what can you do to be there? But let's get into the more interesting problem. What about your own services? So the platform can maybe give you some of these features and let you do these hot upgrades. How can your services deal with this? And fundamentally, we're moving to a world now where people want to release more often. Like, why do people want to release more often? Many different reasons. Get someone like Dave to talk to you about continuous delivery because they want the feedback cycles from the market. But we're in a world now where people want to release often and get that feedback really quickly. If you're waiting a long time, to get a feature out and get feedback. In fact, actually, in some of the trading scenarios I work on, market events happen whereby you can't wait for a release in three months. You can't even wait for a release that evening. You sometimes have to react that day and take action to it. Or you may find the security flaw is not in your own platform. It's in your own code and you need to get it out and get fixed and keep going. So you've got to be able to release more often. Now, how do you do some of this? Well, fundamentally it stands out is once you start doing hot upgrades is you have a system that's running with multiple versions at any given point in time. You don't have the same version everywhere and that's something you just kind of got to get used to. And as systems get more and more complex, you won't just have a core system with its own version. It'll be talking to other systems with multiple versions and stuff at any given point in time. Like, how do we do this? What well, cannot be inspired by biology is you only react to what you know. Like the reason we can function as humans, like the amount of sensory input we take in through our eyes or ears or all of our other senses, it's just vast. We function because we filter to what's relevant and what we know about and what we can deal with. You do the same thing with software. So whenever you're seeing messages coming at you on the network, you only react to what you know how to deal with. And so this is one of the ways where you actually get a lot less security issues and you get a lot less bugs in your own code because often people just pick up messages and start processing them without thinking about them. That would be kind of dangerous. Like, have you ever noticed how most animals are cautious and careful of things? Sort of kids can be a bit as well, but yet some of us as adults are kind of terrible and we just poke our finger into something. Not good. So only deal with what you know how to deal with. So fundamentally, we'll be talking about messages at this point. So as messages are coming at you, we're going to be changing them because we're upgrading. We need to version them. We need to put versions onto all of our messages. Now, messages are actually relatively easy in that the only way you can change a message is by extension. You never take anything away. If you take a field away, you're going to broken how something else handles it. You must only ever extend and extend optionally. So anything that you've extended, it has to be an optional feature so that other things that don't support that can deal with it as defaults. Right? And so you start dealing with that where you're going to get a message with a new field in it, you ignore it, back to the first principle. And for people who are in other parts of the system who have got updated and more modern software, they're, they're seeing messages from old systems, they're going to be missing fields, so they've got to default them and deal with them as optional at that sort of point. And that was relatively simple of going forward. Often a simple ordinal on your message is good enough to give you the versioning. Where it starts to get more interesting is the protocols you have, the conversations 
between things. Like This is another one of my big bugbears, is when people design systems, they get obsessed with the code and the internals and the stuff that they want to play with. If I design a system, that's the last thing I look at. Look at it from the outside in. What is the interaction protocol you're going to have with this system? Find the protocol. It's a conversation, and it's got state, and it's got memory, typically, and how you're dealing with it. So design your protocols for how you're going to deal with it and start versioning them. So not just the messages, version your protocols. How do you kind of do that? Well, any given session, start off with some sort of a connect message. And part of the connect message is you will exchange the versions of the protocol that you understand with your counterparty. And that way you can know that if I've got a more updated version and someone's got a, a version that's a bit behind, will you treat them accordingly? Including making some things optional or compensating for different things. And semantic versioning is your friend here. Like, who's familiar with semantic versioning? Good. It's amazing how many people release software into the world and don't, especially libraries and stuff them up on GitHub and sort of Maven Central and stuff. If you do release anything, please use semantic versioning, make the world much nicer for everyone else. But you're down to major version, minor version, and patch. Patch is where you've changed something, maybe fixed a bug, but there's no new functionality and the system won't be behaving any differently other than the fixed bug. For example. Minor version is typically where you're adding a feature that's optional, others don't have to use it. A major version is where you've got a breaking change that two things that are not on the same major version cannot communicate with each other. But if you version your protocols, you enter a really interesting way of you can translate as well. Like, we can be in a room where not everyone speaks English. People speak other languages. Well, you could speak one language to one and one language to another person, and that's fine. But if you've had that exchange and know what languages are possible, then you can do that. So that's how things interact. What about your system itself? Features. You're going to roll out new features. And this is it's the realm of feature flags are required. Now, the cool thing about having something like a replicated state machine in your system is you can upgrade all of your given nodes. Like, when do you activate the new feature? Well, if you're sending events into a system and that log of events is deterministic and goes to all nodes and is replayed in a deterministic fashion, a feature can be turned on deterministically. So you send in a message to enable a feature. By doing that, you don't use JMX or send something to twiddle something because that will not be consistent and safe. You do it the same way you do everything else in a replicated state machine. It comes in the front door as a message. And that message flows through and enables it everywhere. Like how to do feature flag? Well, a really nice way to do it is a big bit array where each bit represents a feature and you put a version number on the front of that so you know what you're dealing with. This is a really nice way to roll out features in your system and put them into that. And you can switch things on and off as you want, but you can do it in a consistent way. This is one golden rule is once something's out there, you can never take it back. And as organizations get bigger and more complex, you know that you'll want to upgrade and you'll want to fix other things, but different things in an organization will prevent it. So you've got to be able to cope with that and do it well. Now, there's a number of things we can do to get this right. And particularly around protocols, I find an awful lot of it comes down to just good design. You have to be super strict with encapsulation. You have to be interacting with systems based upon expected behavior, not internal representation. So where this gets very difficult with systems is where people start adding state to their messages because they find it difficult to track it themselves. They'll piggyback the messages with some state. That will break encapsulation and make the changes much more difficult. So it's a, it's a bit like the sort of don't ask for something manipulated, so like the tell don't ask type principle, encapsulate things really well. Like a lot of things that we should just be doing in normal code, if you don't do them, at the scale of enterprise messaging, it gets a lot more painful. So it's not that it's anything radically new, it's do all of the really good principles of design, when you, especially when you're at scale, because it's much harder to fix it and deal with it. Once we've got that in place, systems are going to stop and start at different stages, they're going to have different nodes handing over. It's really important to have 
handover and recovery protocols to how things work. Notice I keep saying protocols because I think this is the key. This is how we scale societies. This is how we scale in any way. Like you look at the military, look at medicine, look at almost every discipline. They're rooted in protocols. Our industry needs to grow up with some of this and catch up as well. But so if we've got two systems talking to each other, if you lose connections, if they start and restart at different times, how do you continue and go forward? Like, see people talking about exactly once the delivery. It makes me laugh. It's just so daft and wrong. Like, Axia transactions, we all heard of them. Anybody used Axia transactions? Has anybody actually read the SPAC? Have reached the end of the SPAC and they talk about heuristics and all the cases where it can go wrong, and yet everybody believes in this stuff? It's actually been formally proven to be incorrect and broken, yet we still do that. It seems like exactly one's delivery. It is not possible. But we can build systems that work really well using techniques like idempotence. So it's much, much easier to design something for delivery at least once and start dealing with item potence. That sort of thing works really nicely. But also, like, what do we do as humans? If we've had a conversation in the past and we're not totally sure where we got to, where do we leave off? What do we have as an interaction when we meet up with that person again? It's like, oh yeah, hi Dave. Oh, what were you we doing last week or whatever? Where did we leave off? We have this conversation to reestablish data in a conversation. Why not do that with our systems? That's the way we need to design our systems to catch up. Like you, you see like a gateway loses connection to another server. Maybe it restarts, whatever. And it's going to go, well, do you know what? I want to have exactly once delivery of every message and you better sort it out. That's not a good way. It's much better to say, this is what I thought I sent to you last. Did you get it? And the other side goes, well, this is what I seen from you last. And this is what I sent to you last. Let's work it out from there. Much, much cleaner way of doing that. And grab me and talk me in the hall if you want to sort of know more about that. Where it gets really interesting is things like disaster recovery. So what's different between sort of typical fault tolerance and consensus-based algorithms and disaster recovery? Well, what if your data centers are so far apart that if you're trying to get consensus among them, it's going to increase your latency so much that your system becomes unworkable. Like a financial exchange that's trading in the tens of microseconds cannot be stretched across data centers that are geographically far apart just because of speed of light. Well, speed of two thirds of light, which to be correct, using fibers these days or microwave links, however people are going. But it's, it's a distance that just isn't acceptable. So we need to then think about, well, how do we recover across these distances? And does it matter? Right? Anybody been following what's been going on with cloud providers this year? Have we seen like, stories that have mentioned thermal events? Uh, I've had three customers in this year have experienced thermal events from their data center providers. What they were, were global temperatures in different regions got so high, data centers had to be shut down because the cooling didn't work. There's one in London, one in South Africa, and one in New York that I personally was aware of this year, where data centers were shut down. Guess what? This is going to become more and more common. <laughs> so we need to cope with this. So even when we think can we lose a whole data center? Because people are talking about, we've got amazing cooling, all redundant. We've got redundant power supplies. We've got backup generators. We've got all of this stuff. All that stuff doesn't matter when the ambient temperature of the outside world gets so high, your cooling system can't cope. And the only choice then is to shut data center down. And that sort of thing happens. So we need to be able to cope with that. And that's where kind of RPO comes into it. So your recovery point objective. How much data are you willing to loss? Well, the kind of cool thing about these log replication systems is if you know what throughput your system can make, the rough sizes of your messages, and you've got a messaging system that's really good at getting data from A to B, you can work out what you're willing to tolerate as loss in your worst case scenario, because that's what you'll see. So you start to think about those things, and then you get your system up and recovered from that point. But for these other systems, like often people are doing cold standbys. So they may get data to somewhere. They may be loading it from tape. They may be loading it from desk and starting it over again. If you've got replicated state machines running in another environment, 
You can continue keeping good service going by having a warm standby of that. So it's actually built all the state is ready to go at a moment's notice if it ever needs to, and that can be running in another case. So why am I talking about some of this? Well, if you're in a regulated financial industry like retail banking, a number of times per year, you can be asked to invoke your disaster recovery policy. Like, I've been there when you get the regulator that turns up and they turn up with the police. And it's that simple. They say, invoke your DR policy now. You've just had a major event. And if you say no, the police are there to arrest directors. <laughs> so it happens. <laughs> it gets to happen. If we're able to ship that data to another place and do that, we're able to do it. But how can we do hot upgrade in this stage? Well, it's down to those recovery and handover uh, policies again, because what you do is you pick a relatively quiet time where you're going to do that, and you can avoid the data loss by saying, I'm going to invoke this, sweep across the data, stall and buffer for a little bit, and then redirect to the new place. And so we can continue and do this sort of stuff. So kind of quickly to wrap up at this point, like, if we do this sort of things, like what sort of stuff matters at the extremes? To get a bit into the nuts and bolts of it, one of the tools that's really nice is multicast. Multicast is your friend for a lot of these sorts of systems. So if you've got a system you're talking to a multi-node cluster, if you're using TCP or even reliable UDP unicast streams, if you lose the main point of contact, you've got to establish another point of contact. Even in a really fast reactive system, that still takes some time. And we can optimize these things and make it really quite fast. But still, nothing can beat where something's multicasted to multiple nodes. So in the case of a handover, the data is already going to the other node. And it's a kind of cool thing. In our cloud providers, that's not quite so common. But there are things coming and there's techniques to deal with it. So that's partially it. The big thing is kind of async all of the things. I, I, I've banged on about this through so many different things over the years. Like we avoid async for some bizarre reason, thinking it's hard. At any sort of scale or any sort of interesting quality, async is so much better for the options it provides you than synchronous style communications. And let's face it, that's how the real world is. And sort of like physics, it's a thing. Everything takes time. To pretend that everything is instantaneous is just insane. Yet we do this in software. We keep trying to have this. I got, I've been stopped even at conferences making statements like that. And people have told me off saying, but it's software. It's not physical. <laughs> just get angry. <laughs> it is. Get over it. And how do we deal with the complex things that are... So this is one of the more interesting things. So taking those snapshots, that can take time. Certain computations take time. We don't want to pause things. So, and we just get around that by backgrounding things. So put things in the background, coordinate again with messaging. It's all a really nice way to do this. And so you can function at scale. But if there's one thing I make as a mistake quite regularly, is I forget the version stuff. Right? I know how important versioning is. I've been trying to drill this into myself for years. And I'll make mistakes, just like we all make mistakes. Version, version, version. If there's one thing, it's like put a checklist almost on a system at any sort of scale when things are coordinating and working together, they must be versioned. It's the only way we can keep track of this and make it all work and decide what sort of conversations we can have between given systems. And if you want to play with something that can do some of this, Try Aaron. It's, it's an open source project. It's something I work on. And we've been doing clusters, running these types of things. And the, the cool thing is we were doing it all for fault tolerance and low latency. And customers have driven us to do more and more in this space around 24-7 and hot deployment. Because they kind of realized quite quickly this is the, one of the real benefits of it besides the other things that we have. And on that, I'll thank you very much. <laughs>